uh, we're lucky enough to be here today with Aya Chitindria um, from Viveka Hermitage in uh, Australia. And we feel very blessed to, to be joined by you, Aya. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, you're welcome. A pleasure. Aya Jitindriya was born in Australia uh, and first trained as a monastic in the Theravada forest tradition lineage of Ajahn Shah and Ajahn Sumedho for over 16 years from 1988 to 2004, including time at Abhayagiri Forest Monastery. After leaving the monastic order, she gained a master's degree in Buddhist psychotherapy practice with the Karuna Institute in the UK and continued to teach meditation and retreats on invitation, returning to live in Australia in 2008. She practiced as a Buddhist psychotherapist and taught meditation, Buddhism, and psychotherapy in various capacities. She is the director of training for Australian Association of Buddhist Counselors and Psychotherapists for several years. In early 2018, Ayachitindriya re-entered the monastic life at Santi Forest Monastery in southern highlands of New South Wales and held the role of guiding teacher and spiritual director there for a time. In 2021, she helped to set up Viveka Hermitage in southern New South Wales, where she now resides with Seminary Jayasara, who we interviewed a few weeks ago, and a, a monastic cat who we just met. Named I, Sumudu. Sumudu, yeah. who's 22 years old, which we was thought was pretty, pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so, Aya, thank you for joining us. Yeah. yeah. Sumudu Mahateri. Mahateri. Oh, she impressive. is a Mahatera. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, I am curious with uh, the biography that we just read, um, it just starts with uh, you, your first time uh, ordaining. Uh, and I'm curious if you might just be willing to say uh, what it was that first inspired you, got you into, uh, into Buddhism or meditation or wanting to ordain even. Yeah. You know, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I, it probably goes back a long way, but let's say my first... Um, uh, practice or being drawn into meditation. I, I studied art. I went to art school, and um, is, this was in the 70s, late 1970s, I guess, mid to late 1970s. And transcendental meditation was really entering the university campuses around that time in Australia. So I, you know, learnt the practice of transcendental meditation, which was a repetition of a mantra, but it all, it all felt very spiritual and um, um, pertinent. At around the same time, I also found Ram Dass's purple book, Be Here Now. Um, you're not of the generation necessarily to have been influenced by that, but it's, it's an absolute classic if you could find it. It's... Um, it's brilliant. And, um, and also where I was at um, my first college year on, at, at art school, Lama Yeshe and Lama Zopa came to town. And so I had the opportunity to uh, attend a Dharma talk they gave. I don't remember much about it except being impressed. So this is, I was, you know, um, 17, 18 years old at the time. But my search for truth um, really was popping up much earlier in my life at different stages. And in retrospect, you know, I, I feel like I must have been um, in a Buddhist tradition previously because the search for truth was very much coalescing in my mind as um, the need to understand suffering how it was coming about, and with an intuitive sense that it was possible to find peace if one could understand this territory. And so my intuitive searching was around that. And um, through art school, I became much more through the practice of art, because I was always... Um, let's say I had a proficiency in art from a young age, but I remember at school and high school suddenly becoming aware of awareness itself uh, through this process of looking at something that I was drawing, becoming aware of awareness itself. And it, um, I couldn't have articulated it exactly like that at the time, but it felt profound. I felt there's something profound here 
but I, I equated it with the practice of art. So art was my religion for some time in that process. And, but it became an, an inquiry into the process of consciousness and perception and reality through the visual media, through the visual sense. And my desire to paint was, in my youthful naivety, I wanted to paint something that represented the ultimate truth. But I didn't know what that was yet, so I had to, you know, find my way through this territory. And so with my little antenna out, one thing led to another. I travelled overseas, as many young Australians did, on a one-way ticket, thinking that um, I might find some deeper understanding, looking at other cultures, how they lived, how they did things. You know. um, I encountered Buddhism in Thailand, but I couldn't enter into it. I saw it was there, but it was very culturally, um, for me as a young woman, I didn't find the opportunity to uh, access it apart from just seeing the monks and having a couple of interesting encounters. Um, and in my short time in India at that time, traveling towards Europe, um, in Varanasi, I fell in love with a batik of the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree. I saw it and felt immediate peace. And that was like, you know, so I, I acquired this batik and it traveled with me to England. But eventually it was when I arrived in England after some time and I realized the answers aren't out there, that I had to learn how to meditate more deeply and um, that I felt the answers were, were in, inward, inward, to be found inwardly. And then strangely enough, I just encountered a, a Burmese Buddhist Vihara with Dr. Rewata Dhamma teaching and he eventually guided me to Amaravati. And then I found, I. I booked myself on a 10-day retreat at Amravati in 1987, the beginning of 1987, and that was with Ajahn Amaro, the day after the winter retreat ended. And so I had 10 days of receiving these profound uh, Buddhist teachings, and it was on hearing the Four Noble Truths that I kind of went, aha, that's it. That's it. That's what I've been looking for. It was a surprise that it was a religious spiritual package in some sense, but um, it gave me the opportunity to inquire more deeply within a framework that I could understand and, and work with. And so meditation became the thing that uh, led my attention and, and um, kind of creative inquiry. I thank you. Um... I'm curious uh, if you, I, I mean, I, I want to get to the core of your path and uh, what teachings you've held with you over these years, but just a quick tangent, um, where do you feel uh, art fits now in the spiritual path? Um, how would you conceive of that? I know Emerson said that the three transcendentals are goodness, truth, and beauty. And I feel like Buddhism has a great deal of goodness and truth, but I, I know very few monastics who've cultivated or looked into that third transcendental of beauty. Um, how, how have you seen art used skillfully in the service of the path and, and do you still use it at all? I don't use it at all now. I, I, I tried to return to it, but I think my, my channel of creativity went much more into the contemplative um, for want of a better word, in inner world, but it's you know it's the contemplation of of all. Um, but that, like I said, it was within the process of making art, which is strongly hinges on observing. At least when you're wanting to paint and draw or learning to paint and draw, you're really spending a lot of time observing the object. And this is where awareness itself can come to the fore. So it's really so, so very central to, um, let's say, the territory of understanding the way perception works and recognising the power of awareness, um, both in a, in a dualistic sense as an observer, but also in the non-dual, ultimate sense of things. Um, not all artists follow this up, I would say, perhaps 
some are more uh, perhaps interested in the social dimension of art. But many, many artists through history have been um, spiritually minded or philosophical, philosophically minded, and their art has led them into existential inquiry. And their, their representation, their work has been similarly created to guide the viewer to a, a similar existential inquiry. That's my, my view. So I think it has a profound place, but it is misunderstood by the non-artistic or the non-creative minds in our tradition, I think, because you sometimes get the message that oh, beauty is just a visual perception. Beauty is of the same value as, of, as ugliness. At one level it is, but there's a transcendent level of beauty, as you pointed to, the, um, which can be useful and supportive for a spiritual path. And even it's even found within the Theravada suttas. There's one place where the, that I remember where the Buddha talks about uh, being able to enter jhana based on the perception of the beautiful, the sign of the beautiful. And you know, there was no there was no judgment of that. There was no critique. I what's the closest? Um, what piece of art have you seen that came the closest to that? Uh, articulation of the transcendent or the ultimate reality that you've ever come across or you know of all the ones you've seen piece of art you mean? yeah what piece of art oh gee i have to really go through my mental archives to recollect i, I was influenced strongly by or attracted strongly to certain artists but the first one that comes to mind is rothko mark rothko an american um modern painter. I don't know if you know Rothko's work. They're colour fields, very amorphous colour fields. Yeah, so you can you can Google Mark Rothko. And, and of course, you know, these imagery, things have changed so much since the advent of computers, of the internet, because people have been flooded with imagery now. So it doesn't have the same power as it used to. Uh, with um, you know pre-modern and post-modern art, they were bringing powerful images to people who weren't flooded with the kind of imagery we have now. So it affects the mind differently. Yeah, thank you, Aya. Um, I think we'll probably almost would we'll get back to the chronology of uh, of your life, but just on this on this theme of. Uh, coming to an appreciation of awareness itself, like first through, through art and then finding something similar in, in meditation, um, whether probably almost certainly with Lumpur Sumedho and then maybe with the teachings of Ajahn Chah and the canon. And I'm curious if looking back for you and just looking in the present, has it changed? Has your, has, you know, the Dhamma door is different for you. You were seeing this awareness itself, appreciating it, through art in the beginning and then through meditation and you've now you know been been in robes and been practicing meditation in Buddhism for um, a long time so curious has it changed and how has it changed if it has um, yeah so I think um, the quality of awareness has always been the how should I put it um, that which inspires me um, is ever present, always accessible, and something in me knows the truth lays there. Right, but my Dharma door has, for many years and for a long time, been the the Dharma door of dukkha, contemplation of dukkha, that which obstructs um, freedom doesn't obstruct awareness, but can obstruct the sense of um, freedom, you know, this experience of dukkha. So the contemplation of the Four Noble Truths has been very core in my own practice, and perhaps that's because Ajahn Sumedho used to teach very strongly around this paradigm. But also within the, the Dharma door of dukkha, you can't ignore the Dharma door of anicca and, and anatta or emptiness. So the contemplation of these, you know, have been my Dharma doors. But awareness 
is both the means, awareness is that which allows us to observe and engage in contemplation and practice. And in a way, I exposure to other traditions of Buddhism have helped me to get clearer and articulate more what this awareness is. So within the um, Tibetan tradition, we have the term the ground, the ground of being or the ground of awareness, which is also the fruit. Once obstructions, once confusion, once kilesa are abated, that very ground, the realisation of which is also the fruit. So you never leave, ultimately you never leave home base. That's the delusion, that's the illusion we have to come to terms with and and um, fully comprehend, understand, before we can dwell in the fruit of, as Ajahn Chah says, being Dharma. Okay. Thank you, Aya. Um, with the uh, this focus on the core ground of, of awareness and guiding intuition and um, the transcendent, I, I feel like these terms in some ways are even more meaningful considering your trajectory through uh, into robes in various capacities and then out of robes and then into the secular Buddhist world and then back into robes. It, it seems like this unifying threads drawn you through so many different situations. Um, how, can, can you speak about that journey? Um, what, what drew you um, back into robes out of when you re-entered the secular world and what what was the experience of disrobal and re-robal like for you, if if we can ask about that, as much as you'd be interested in sharing, and how is that guided by the the dhamma in your heart? Well, I think it's all it was all guided by the dharma in my heart, you know, and all of it was completely unexpected in a way. You know, I showed up at the monastery um, at Amaravati. Um, just three years after it was established, not even two to three years after it was established with a, a, a budding double community, had I, no, I had no idea, I had no idea or, or expectation of ordination, but within a year or so, you know, it was it was looming up as a definite possibility, and I think within eighteen months, I'd taken Anagarika precepts and. And it was always, I didn't know where this was leading, but I, this was the main interest in my life. Nothing else interested me more. I had no desire. I used to say to myself when I was, you know, after school, like I felt fortunate in a way. I thought I could do anything I want, you know. What, what is it I want to do? And I just couldn't answer that question. What is it I want to do? You know, I could do anything I want. That's the that's the great good fortune that our generation was popped into, at least in the in working middle class families or middle class families with education. I felt like I could do anything, but what did I want? I didn't know. And the search was what what is the best thing to want, you know, if I could choose anything. And so it eventually became clear that this path practice to realize the deathless, to realize the truth, was the most, um, the best thing I could pursue. But not just for my own benefit, because I had a desperate need <laughs> to realize the end of suffering. There was a lot of internal suffering that was driving the search, internal confusion, but also I realized it was for the benefit of all. It was the best thing that anyone could do in whatever capacity, monastic or lay. So anyway, that took me into the monastic life and I didn't take, there wasn't the concept of life vows, you know, you initially commit to five years. And, but I, I wasn't, people would ask me, you're going to stay forever, I, I don't know, I don't know. But when it came to when I was contemplating stepping out of the monastic life, it was also something, it was very hard because I hadn't thought that I would, it would be me contemplating this. I'd seen other monastics disrobe before me, but I was like, I didn't think it would be me having to do this. Very, very hard decision when you 
dedicate your life to something very deep. Um, so that took a long time to, to work through, in a sense. But something had shifted, something had changed, and I moved into my early 40s, having ordained when I was 25. This is a significant life uh, change anyway, psychologically, <clears throat> emotionally. It's like you get halfway, you look back, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? And uh, you start to become just naturally more psychologically astute as to what's been driving you and how those drivers have been set up and et cetera, et cetera, and your own habitual ways of being. But anyway, it felt karmically, uh, karmically inevitable that I step out. But I remember when I actually... I, even though I was living with Lumpur Samedo, I wrote him a long letter because I knew it was the best way that I could explain all my process before actually kind of coming to him face to face with this um, this new situation. And um, but I remember saying to him, you know, the Dharma's in my heart, and if I'm open to taking robes again, if it ever becomes clear, it's the way forward. You know. And so, and so it was that after about 13, 14 years in lay life, which was a very interesting journey itself. I mean, it took a lot of faith to step out of the monastic homeless home into real kind of homelessness um, <clears throat> without a lot of resources, you know. So it was an interesting journey in itself and, and looking at the... Uh, the unformed ego in some new kind of um, formation. It was quite a journey. And um, had the good fortune to, to study Buddhist psychotherapy, which is very, very relevant to relational life, what they call the relational field, and still continuing to look at how dukkha arises within the relational field intrinsically. And, yeah, so eventually just coming to a place where I'd, main, I'd continued to teach the Dharma, but um, at some point in myself, I became clearer that, how can I say, that the Dharma was still the central force in my life and there was something drawing me out of the secular world to a more focused practice. Again, I didn't conceive of <clears throat> re-entering robes, re-entering the monastic life, but an opportunity arose in a very unusual way. And almost just like the first time, I realized this is a window of opportunity that is open for a very brief moment. You either jump now or not. And my first time, I felt like I was just riding the crest of one last wave into Amravati because I'd stalled for a bit. Um, and this time it was like there's this very brief, unusual window of opportunity. I was 54 and I thought, why not? <laughs> Again, I just had the circumstances in one's life was just allowed it to be so. And I thought, who gets the opportunity twice in a life? I've got to, got to do it. But that was fueled by increased um, samvega and um, nibida spiritual urgency, a sense of dispassion, and uh, just wanting to focus down more. Yeah. It's rare to get this perspective of someone who has been in robes and then leaves the robes and then comes back. And, you know, oftentimes you hear somewhat cartoonish depictions of one side's perceptions of the other, especially, you know, you get an inspired monk, they've been in monk or nun, they've been in robes for a period of time, and then, you know, it's easy to have this uh, either, either like rosy retrospection or this always greener on the other side perception or um, this like everything's worse on the other side perception. So uh, your, your perspective is really valuable. So I'm glad we could um, could hear some of it. I'm, I'm curious to hear more about the Buddhist psychotherapy aspect, like in studying that, and, and I'm sure like in your, as you continue to uh, consider the principles of what you've learned there and um, think maybe through those uh, those lenses. What do you think are some things uh, from a Buddhist psychotherapy point of view that might be missing in other presentations of the Dhamma 
uh, on the positive end. So what are some useful tools that they have that other presentations don't? And then what are some, maybe some drawbacks, uh, some things which the Buddhist psychotherapy lens does not have, which maybe a more traditional uh, religious, Buddhist religious uh, perspective might have? Well, I think what became clear to me <clears throat> through my own processes, both as a monastic, excuse me, <clears throat> but subsequently um, in lay life and studying and this um, Buddhist psychotherapy, was that actually our spiritual process is a psycho-spiritual process. And one of the drawbacks of monasticism, I, I think, in the way that it can sometimes be held or taught, is we, we sideline a lot of the psychological, emotional stuff that actually really needs to be grappled with and, and worked with and brought onto the path and understood. Um, so looking at the developmental aspects of the human being, that they really they can't be transcended in, until they're fully embraced. That's my understanding and my lived experience. So often the, the difficult psychological and emotional territory we might encounter, we all encounter as human beings, but as, as monastics we might encounter. I think in monasticism we don't always have the tools to deal with that because of the transcendent languaging and the, the, the dualistic split between body and mind that can get entrenched, that transcendence is the only thing to go for, the rest is dukkha, so leave it behind. But actually, it can't be left behind until it's become fully conscious and we've fully embraced it and, and compassion and wisdom then releases the mind, releases the being naturally through un, full, full understanding. So I found in my own let's say, struggles within monastic life. And I say struggles, it's not because of monastic life. It's inevitable that we have to traverse this territory as human beings. And monasticism gives us a container and some good tools to work with that. But I, as I said, not often the right tools to hold the emotional, psychological territory in a skillful way. Some people benefit tremendously if they have close connections with teacher. Uh, and I think that's why the, the Tibetan tradition really puts a lot of emphasis on this unconditional relationship with the, the guru. Has its drawbacks too, but this is one of its benefits. But um, in terms of the skills one needs, I found I was able to articulate what was needed more. I, you know, I found the capacity of compassion, self-compassion within my monastic life, but I found that articulated much more strongly within the psychotherapeutic realm. That, and it's not just self-compassion, it's compassion that goes both ways for oneself and, and others. But we encounter the world here in this heart. Everything happens in this heart. So compassion has to be that which is, embraces everything that is experienced within our own chitta, within our own mind, heart, body, mind, spirit. Um, so I found that the psychotherapeutic languaging and, and um, framework tend to, tended to support that expression of compassion more, um, particularly as you work in a relational field. You learn to work as therapist with client in the relational field. And in our training, where clients and therapists were swapping position the whole time. And this language of the relational field, we know you, you come to understand that we're always in a relational field. Even if it's even if we're in solitary retreat and not seeing others, we're still existing and uh, experiencing within a relational field. It may be an internalized relational field. So this is this is um I think with the psychotherapeutic training, finding a, a new language, which was not at all div divorced from my Buddhist understanding, because this karuna training is very steeped in Buddhist frameworks. It was an, an enhancement and an enrichment and a broader way to contemplate 
the relational field and how the conditioned processes of dukkha or suffering arise and cease, you know, within that framework. Just saying I found it very powerful as a, as a way of practice. That's really good um, hearing that. And uh, I think I totally agree that we have a lot to learn, specifically as you're highlighting an area of compassion and getting feedback and learning about this relational field. Um, two related questions are, yeah, just what do you think someone who's going only from a Buddhist psychotherapy, perhaps a secular Buddhist psychotherapy point of view, like what might they be missing? And um, also somewhat related is this concept of spiritual bypassing. I think this is something which um, actually as monastics, we might be somewhat um, prone to, or uh, it's something which we, it might happen if, we, if we're not uh, paying attention, if we're not um, yeah, getting feedback. And, you know, the original book entitled Spiritual Bypassing, um, it's really interesting, a lot of good points, but it, at, at some point in the book, as I was understanding it, it does say that um, the authors believe that uh, it's actually impossible to maybe achieve awakening or to really gain deeper insights without some kind of psychotherapy. And I'm curious if you would uh, believe that or what, what role you feel like psycho, um, spiritual bypassing, how to avoid that. I mean, just with regards to that statement, I mean, psychotherapy happens whether you get it or not. If you're interested in inquiring into the source of dukkha, <clears throat> it arises in your own heart and it's, it's a conditioned process. And if you're getting more clarity looking into that process, um, <clears throat> what should I say? It's you start to see the conditioned and conditioning factors. And why I say the process is a psycho-spiritual one, because it inevitably includes our developmental processes as human beings. Because so much of our behavior and our responses in the world is conditioned from an early age. And not just from that, I don't believe you come in with a blank slate because we've got the underlying tendencies from past lives. It seems pretty obvious to me, but you don't have to believe that to see this same process of conditioning. You know, just looking biologically at the way the, the human brain develops, it's very, very vulnerable. And from in utero, it's being conditioned by the experiences of, of the parents and the environment the parents abide in. There is so much, not to mention during birth and after birth, the conditioning of the brain and the, the brain is still developing, you know, for, for many, many years. Um, so what happens to that developing brain, the developing being is very important and how that being learns to survive within an environment where uh, bad stuff happens and good stuff happens. They adapt, the brain, brain and body learns to adapt in order to survive. This is one view of the biological interaction, how it affects our view of the world. It affects everything, the way we view the world, the way we interact with the world, our fears, our hopes, our desires, our sublimations, our idealizations. You know, so we have to actually encounter that territory almost backwards. You know, in the spiritual life, we, we will encounter the, the terror, the rage, the, the, the intense desire, aversion. Um, we will encounter all these monsters. <clears throat> and the Buddha just called them kalesa. You know, that's one way of calling them. Uh, in Tibetan tradition, you know, they're the wrathful deities <laughs> that can be transformed. They're ultimately empty. They ultimately have empty, wise compassion as their essence. Um, so, you know, coming to terms with these things and integrating. Integrating is one word for um, coming to awakening, I think. Integrating and becoming free of the entanglements of the confused mind, yeah. So <clears throat> in terms of, you know, whether one can go through this process without their own psychotherapy just depends. I mean, psychotherapy is just a relational, a wholesome relational field. 
preferably where the therapist has a lot of wisdom and compassion and presence. So I, I compare this to the wise teacher in, say, the monastic field, relational field. If there's a wise, compassionate teacher who can be present and help you find clarity through your processes and that you can trust enough that you, you, can tra you can traverse this territory as well. But it very much depends on the capacity of the individual, how much trauma they may have had in their, their individual lives, how much wisdom they already have, you know? I, uh, um, I'm, uh, this movement and uh, speaking to this sort of uh, sub subconscious or the deeper roots um, that lie in in us and needing to learn to integrate and articulate and encounter them and and what the West's uh, allowed us to you know how the West has provided some skillful means for that is is really interesting um, I know that there are there have been different approaches to that and where is one of them you know perhaps couched in the language of Freud or others is fairly dry and psychological. I know the language of Jung is not and involves, uh, you know, motions to the art that you've spoken of, even the painting behind you, the Tonka, these archetypal stories. Um, and I'm curious about where you see those skillful means as helpful and necessary. Um, in some ways, I feel like the Buddha gave us the simplest story possible in the Four Noble Truths and so that it would last millennia. But it seems like sometimes these skillful means of these greater stories involving, you know, these archetypal forces in us articulated through art that have popped up in every tradition um, are also maybe important for some people and particularly certain personalities, perhaps. For me, I found um, art to be really, really meaningful. And I'm especially interested in one story of the masculine and the feminine right now. It seems like a lot of the points you've uh, articulated um, in terms of a certain perhaps dryness or lack of relational field in in monasticism at times um, might in an arty archetypal sense be said to be because a lack of the feminine strength or story. Um, so I know there's a lot there, but yeah, I'm curious, first of all, if you see a place for those other more colorful stories and if there's a, a place for... Um, yeah, what you see about that masculine and feminine story at work in our hearts. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I think in different traditions express things differently. So I, I do think within the Theravadan tradition, it is very dominantly masculine. And there is there is a lack of the uh, representation of the feminine and respect for the feminine. Um, within that, but that's the way that tradition has developed. But we see that being countered within the Mahayana tradition and the Tibetan tradition, it's particularly with the emphasis on compassion. Um, <clears throat> not as as um, uh, as distinct from wisdom, but inseparable to uh, with wisdom and and the need for that, and then more more say feminine archetypal representations. Um, but having said that, I think different people are drawn to different things because of their own characteristics. And and I was I explored different traditions, but I was really drawn to the Theravada, well, at least the forest tradition, Ajahn Chah, Ajahn Sumedho, because, you know, I explored um, a, a Tibetan uh, situation in, in Australia before I uh, took ordination originally and also... Um, Goenka's retreats and I felt that the Goenka style kind of lacked any insight into emotionality and what to do with it. The message was just keep watching sensations and it felt like a very deadening process. They didn't even allow walking meditation. And then to the Tibetan, to my young mind, was too abstruse. I couldn't understand all the bells and whistles and the iconography. It was all just overwhelming and and I really appreciated the no frills version of the the Theravada and the Four Noble Truths it was to me it was directly accessible in a in a contemplative way but also that you know I entered the the field where there was a, a budding 
um, Western monastic community, so I could relate to these people uh, very easily. It wasn't just in an Asian context, which is different culturally to my own upbringing. But I also had a keen um, appreciation when I heard the stories of Ajahn Chah from Ajahn Amaro. I just had such a, I could feel his sense of humor and his compassion um, and his joy through, through the stories I heard uh, of Ajahn Amaro living with Ajahn Chah and subsequently other monks. So the compassion and the joy and the humor of Ajahn Chah in the little um, anecdotes of the way he would teach the monks and what he would say. He was like just like poking people a lot of the time to help them see uh, what's what's um, where the problem was, you know. And uh, so that really attracted me. <clears throat> so I think different people will be attracted to different traditions. People have, even though I was into art, <clears throat> I think I'm a mental type. You know, E type six, if you know the Enne Enneagram type. So getting getting a handle on the four noble truths, and that that there's a paradigm you can chew on for a lifetime, and and keep getting juice out of it. You know, it has so many deep layers, and it truly is the nutshell, is the essence. So this simple paradigm, I really appreciate that because I think ultimately we need something really simple to return to, because the transcendent is the ultimate simplicity in some sense. And so you need to rest your mind and to gain insight through something simple. That's how, I, that's how it's worked for me, because I, need, I not only need the heart to be nourished, but my mind needs to be nourished too. So it's, it's satisfied with these uh, beautifully aligned paradigms. Having said that, you know, there was a time in my life where there was far too much emphasis on dukkha. I was drowning in dukkha, thinking I was understanding, trying to understand it, but I hadn't, hadn't fully got the right view, you know. I was drowning in the cesspit, thinking I was understanding dukkha. Actually, you just need to stick your nose over the top and say, yeah, it stinks, and leave it alone. <laughs> But, you know, we come to that eventually. I, I really I really appreciate that uh, balanced perspective of, um, yeah, finding some kind of synergy between these different paradigms, the uh, different archetypes of masculine and feminine. Another one which I'm curious about, which I think you could speak to well, um, are just the, the archetypes of the manager and the employee or the director and the follower. And, you know, as... Uh, between your times in robes, after you disrobed, you became the director of training for Australian Association of Buddhist Counselors and Psychotherapists. And now you're basically uh, co-abbess, basically running, directing a, a hermitage. And um, yeah, you know, I certainly, starting this project with Ajahn Nisibo in the Clear Mountain Monastery, seeing how um, putting oneself into a role of responsibility really is somewhat of a, a forcing function for maturity. and But having been just a junior monk with basically no speaking role, just the role is basically be a wallflower and just follow the, the schedule. Um, also seeing the value of that and wondering um, how, what, what you would say about that, how to balance these roles. Well, ideally... Um... And I know ideally never really happens, but it's ideally as, I mean, there's such a beneficial time as junior monastics. I look back and think that's the best time because you don't really hold, I mean, there are certain jobs that you do, but you're not holding major responsibility and you're not teaching yet. And it's a really great time. It might not feel like it because you want to be more senior or you you don't like who you're sitting next to or you don't like the job you're given or whatever, but, but actually it's the best time for, for contemplation and practice because you're not holding too many responsibilities and they're not big ones. That's the ideal time. Um, but ideally you gradually, you know, move from your Nawaki years into holding a bit more responsibility and the way that we were trained at Amravati <clears throat> from the get-go is actually... You are sometimes called on 
um, unexpectedly and, and spontaneously to give a little teaching, even in your early years, mm -hmm. uh, you, you confront the terror of fear or the terror, you know, fear of public speaking. But I remember it was my first time encountering pure emptiness. The mind just went blank. It's like, wow, <laughs> that's cool. But I'm terrified because I've got nothing to say, you know, but emptiness. But anyway, we were gradually drawn into experiencing, even just giving a little 20-minute reflection at the end of a community retreat so that only when you start to be invited to teach a bit more formally after your five years of training, <clears throat> it doesn't feel so um, overwhelming. It might still be fearful. but <clears throat> And then you gradually take on more responsibility. So a gradual process moving from, as you say, the wallflower to maybe a manager that doesn't have to control everything, which is, the, you know, the thing that starts to come out. <clears throat> but, you know, that's the ideal. It doesn't always happen in that way. And sometimes you get thrown into responsibility quite early and then you just have to work with your, your responses um, and reactivity to it and others' reactivity to you. I mean, this whole relational field, as you know, within the monastery, it's not what people think. It's not just a nice little community. There's lots of stuff going down in that relational field, you know, and it's always changing. So, <clears throat> yeah, transitioning from, I've done a lot of those kind of transitions in my life also from just being on solitary retreat and coming back into community and being, I think I did, detected in my first round of monastic life, there was a fear of responsibility. It's not that I wasn't able to be responsible. It was probably more that I, I go into over, override with responsibility, thinking I have to be perfect, I have to get it right, and it actually causes a lot of stress. So I think I was avoiding responsibility where I could. But then my entry the second time into monastic life, I was literally thrown into the frying pan at Santi Monastery because I, I was literally thrown the ball of leadership, whereas I thought I was going there to have a, a quiet, retire in a quiet monastic life in a kuti in the forest. But the, the hot ball of leadership was very purposely put in my lap and I had to take on so much. But I'd, I had to take on the director of training in um, the ABCAP, which was slightly reluctantly as well. It got kind of put in my lap. It wasn't a full choice. So I had processes of going through, facing the fear of responsibility, the um, thing in my mind that says it has to be perfect, I have to get it right, overthinking things, the stress of all that, um, to trying to just find a place that says it's okay, you don't have to be perfect, it doesn't always have to be right. Just show up, be present, do what you can, keep breathing. <laughs> And just see where it all goes, you know. But it's a process. It's it's always a learning. It's always a learning curve. And one little anecdote. I, at Santi, I had to come up with a lot of um, encouragements for myself. So I had this A4 sheet I typed out of little blurbs that could encourage me. And one of them was um, to remind myself that Santi, as the monastery where I was thrown the leadership, like, Everything is always changing. Honestly, it was just uh, like a, a sand bed. I don't know, the, forget the term, shifting sands. Everything is always changing. Nothing's perfect. Nothing's ever perfect. And it's always out of control. So that's a reminder about anicca, dukkha, anatta, as it was literally displaying from day to day. And so learning how to rest with that reality, this is just the way it is. Whereas the controller or the manager, or for me, it's the director, the internal director. It would have been a good film director, I think. It's like, it's that one that wants to be in control. But for me, it's like out of fear because when things are out of control, it's frightening. You know, anything can happen. You feel vulnerable, you know. Some, something might catch you off guard. So we each have our different 
um, core reaction to things. What we all have a controller, you know, the ego that wants to keep things in control. But for one person, it might be because of fear we have to stay in control. Another person, it might be a different core emotion of why they have to stay in control. Um, but that's something to be discovered for oneself and um, worked through, moved through, relaxed out of. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, I think the those three encouragements might become our our new mottos. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. That's a uh, those are really helpful, actually. Yeah, yeah, because. You know, because as as human beings, we're always struggling with um, <clears throat> the fact that things are changing, that things are suffering or, or not ideal, not satisfying and uh, out of our control. But we, uh, the delusion is we think we can bring all those things under our control. We can stabilise things. We can make them always nice, um, you know, and that's the delusion. So to accept the reality of an Ichi Dukkha Anatta is ultimately freedom. It doesn't mean you're not responsible anymore, but you're just not fighting a losing battle. Thank you. I, I'm, uh, I'm struck by um, its resonance with a quote I heard from Ayananda Bodhi of here's another cold, here's another hard one coming straight at you from reality or something like that. <laughs> so I, I really like that recollection about not uh, fighting that losing battle. And yeah, it, it, just your words strike um, strike a chord for us right now. I think um, watching the scope of things here expand um, and trying to walk that with grace. I, I I am curious. The we asked this to seminary Jayasara as well, and in terms of this desire to maybe not bring things under under control, but yeah, to find a route away or past dukkha suffering. We have a lot of community members who, um, as Ajahn Sona has put it, have one foot in the monastery and one foot on a banana peel. They encounter the Dhamma and intuit its profundity, and yet their lives um, don't aren't aligned with it in the way that they would like, or they have obligations, um, they aren't able to get to a monastery as much as they want, and there's kind of this constant split in them um, and sense of not doing enough. And what would you say to people in that situation, um, whether or not ordination is the sort of uh, other option held in their heads, um, what would you just say to, to someone who's in that situation of, of really trying to make lay life work and, and not knowing how to do it completely or, or not as much as they would want? Well, the Dharma is everywhere everywhere you are. So we split in our mind. Sometimes when we encounter the Dharma through monastic teachers or a monastery, we think it's mostly there and I have to get there to be a real practitioner. But that's not the case. I mean, this is very much the archetypal presentation uh, of the monastic. But And it's, very, it's a very helpful container. There's absolutely no... You know, no question about that, but it's not for everyone, and it is. It doesn't have to be the only way. It's not the only way. So, for people, that's the one thing people have to recognize. Because if they're splitting in their minds, thinking the practice is only at the monastery or in robes, then they're already undermining themselves. So the practice is wherever you are, with exactly whatever you're encountering. Encountering the true Dharma is there. It's only our minds that think it's somewhere else. And this is the problem even for monastics in monasteries. They still think it's somewhere else. <laughs> they go off to a better monastery or a better teacher somewhere else. And even the subtle movements in our mind are looking for truth somewhere else and forgetting here now, this present moment. It's nowhere else. It's just the, the sankara, the habitual sankara's activities of mind that keeps us looking, thinking at somewhere else. But it's not. And you get these beautiful stories, of, you know, in different traditions pointing to that, you know, like the pauper who's begging, but he's sitting on a treasure box 
sitting on a, a treasure chest begging because he's got nothing. But if he just looked inside the treasure chest, he's as rich as anything, you know. He's just not looking in the right place. And this, this is delusion. This is the confusion we have. So whatever we're encountering, I really encourage people to grab a hold of their life, their karmic situation, like the, the um, proverbial grab the bull by the horns, and be there with that. Don't keep thinking I've got to get somewhere else to even start my spiritual life. It's like it's here. What's happening now? What are you experiencing now? Can I breathe with this? You know, it's this is the, the practice, the contemplation. And this is why the Four Noble Truths, if people really contemplate, they take this nutshell of a teaching, you encounter dukkha everywhere, in the monastery, outside of the monastery. You know, even as a Sotapanna, a Sakyadagami, Anagami, they're still encountering dukkha. If not fully awoken, that's the path. We can find dukkha anywhere. Isn't that liberating? <laughs> In terms of a path of practice? Yeah. I, somewhat of a, a related question, just in terms of the, the form of practice. I mean, you make yeah, grabbing the bull by the horns and really coming to practice in the present moment uh, seems like that's always the right answer. But I feel like you have also, in addition to that, have um, a unique and valuable perspective about the form of a samaneri. You know, in Sri Lanka, I hear that it's, it's very common for someone to, for a male monastic, to ordain as a samanera and be a novice for decades, if not their whole life. And they have no aspirations. They're just fully content being a samanera. And in Thailand, you've got many different forms of uh, ways that people kind of tap into um, yeah, leading uh, a spiritual life, leading even a monastic or a celibate or celibate light or, uh, <laughs> you know, all, all sorts of creative ways to do it. And I'm curious if you could, could speak to that. Maybe first... Um, what it's like being being a samanera, um, uh, how, like, do you, are you just fully content being a samanera and that's just perfect? Um, and yeah, what, um, yeah, it's a very unique perspective. We'd love to hear your, uh, your, your thoughts on that. Mm, mm. Well, when I first ordained at Amaravati, that's the only option we had. We were 10 precept nuns. Um, Dasa Siladara in England um, you know and I, I didn't understand Buddhism, I didn't know much about Buddhism outside of that um, field for quite a while, I didn't know about bhikkhunis or, or whatever and the, the, the resurgence of bhikkhuni ordination in the West hadn't really taken hold so we had the 10 precept training, I mean it was it was in the field, there was some understanding of that but as a as a, someone fresh going into it. it, took me a while, took me a few years to start to pull the threads together. But um, but on top of the ten precepts, um, the nuns, together with Ajahn Sachito, had fleshed out a, a kind of a padimokha of training of 150 um, uh, rules and or precepts and observances, which reflected. Uh, the broader training of a, of a, a bhikkhu or bhikkhuni um, without, you know, having taken, taken that ordination. So we had the benefit of being able to live as, as an arms mendicant in, in more of a full measure in that way. So I've actually only ever known the 10 precept, um, personally, the 10 precept form, even though, you know, there was a desire to move towards bhikkhuni ordination for the community, for myself within the community at Amravati, although, as you know, it, 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 didn't, it didn't happen, hasn't happened yet. So when I re-entered monastic life this time in Australia, as you know, Ajahn Brahm uh, is one of the main monasteries in Australia and he supports bhikkhuni ordination. So I, I thought that would be a natural trajectory for me this time round. And I thought that would be a kind of a completion, kind of a completion somehow. So I thought I was moving towards that, but I encountered certain, um, one could call them obstacles, but I don't want to call them obstacles now because I see the wisdom, the karmic wisdom 
but it just didn't happen the way I thought it would. I, I had an opportunity to take the CUNY ordination in India early on, but it was too soon after seminary ordination and I wasn't that well enough to go to India, so I let that pass by. And, and when another opportunity came up, COVID hit and we didn't have a preceptor coming to Australia, you know, and then I had to wait another full, had to wait full two years as seminary. And by the time this was happening, my health had taken a huge dive uh, at Santi. My health was, a few issues were arising, which were really very challenging and circumstances had changed. And um, so I actually started to consider that maybe it's not the right thing for me to enter into the Bikuni training because I actually had to had to be hands-on looking after my diet for a long time because I had a lot of food um, allergies coming up and a lot of food issues. And that's, as you know, one of the main thing taking the full training is you're completely um, dependent on the food that gets put in your bowl. And um, so I, I realised that wasn't going to be a goal for me at that point in time until things, unless things changed. Thing hasn't, they've changed a little bit. My health has become a bit better, but perhaps not to the point where I would uh, be able to take on that full uh, training <clears throat> physically and, you know, in my mid-50s too. So there's great benefit being able to do it when you're young and healthy. Um, but there are other factors too. When um, the idea of Viveka Hermitage emerged, you mentioned, well, co-abbot, co-abbess of Hermitage, but actually we're just a residence. There's not a lot happening here. So it's a, it's a really quiet residence. We're like a vihara. It's not a public place. So, and we do a lot of online um, work to, to connect with community and provide resources for people. So it feels very different to the, the open house, large monastery model of Santi. And that works also better for my personally for my health too, but also as a, as a preference for leading a more hermetic life. So being a 10 precept nun allows us the, the flexibility to maintain that um, this small vihara lifestyle, whereas if I was a bhikkhuni, it would be far more, far more difficult because of the added rules and, and things, and also needing to, to train with the bhikkhuni uh, for two years. You know, there's, there's various which, you know, wasn't going to be that straightforward either. So I've realised actually I'm comfortable as a 10 priest. It's what I've always known. It provides, allows the flexibility and simplicity um, with my own. Also, I'm accepting my own, um, what I saw at Santi come up again, um, you know, this idea of, being perfect, it's not just an idea, it's kind of um, um, when you're given a lot of rules and you think that you have to be perfect with them, it's a recipe for absolute dukkha. You know, so if you've got a mind that is a perfectionist mind, you know, it, it can be really challenging unless you're living in, in a place where it's modelled really wisely. Um, so I just realised, you know, my mind is more peaceful on 10 precepts and 311 rather than always scanning, what have I done wrong, what have I done wrong? <laughs> Out of 311 rules, what have I done wrong? <laughs> ah, 10 I can manage. And I know they're, they're the major rules. They cover, the, they cover the, the main trajectory of the 227 or the 311, but it's just simpler for me as I'm getting older. Yeah, so that, that's a more conscious choice now rather than a, oh, that's just the way it happened. Hi, thank you. Um, we've kept you for about an hour, over an hour already. Um, so kind of just wanted to finish with one final question, which is if you could recommend uh, or steer people to one, one sutta that you especially love, um, what, would you, what would you recommend? Mm. <clears throat> that's a it's a hard question, isn't it? When there's so many suitors, <laughs> but um, different ones have popped up uh, that I've gone back to again and again over the years. But I think one that speaks to me consistently and has been, you know, great teaching in itself is a very simple one, 
um, from Anguttara tense, the Mula Sutta from Anguttara tense, the root of things. So it's it's when the Buddha is asked, um, you know, where do things come from? And Ajahn Sachita has this lovely translation, which I, yeah. Well, Ajahn Sachita's translation is beautiful. So I'll tell you, shall I tell you that? It's a lovely teaching. <clears throat> um, so it goes, rooted in desire are all things. Or you could equally say rooted in interest, because the Pali word is um, chanda, I think. Um, chanda. Yeah, yeah, do you know chanda? But anyway, the translation is rooted in desire are all things. Born of attention are all things. Arising on contact are all things. Converging on feeling are all things. Headed by concentration are all things. Dominated by mindfulness are all things. Surmounted by wisdom are all things. Yielding deliverance as essence are all things. Merging with the deathless are all things. Terminating in Nibbana are all things. Aya, thank you so much for all the Pali files. That's Anguttara 10.58. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One of my favorite teachings. You're welcome. Aya, thank you for taking the time and for sharing all your wisdom. And uh, it was such a pleasure. Yeah. And look forward to connecting again. Oh, it's lovely. Lovely to talk with you. Yes, please. Take good care. Bye for now.